It is Sunday, May 21st, 2017, and welcome to News Effect. Uh, This is a Flickr Effect podcast where each week we discuss the top five news items of the week uh, from the world of film, television, and pop culture. I'm David Lott. Joining me as always are Bobby Jackson and Michelle Curry. How's it going, guys? Hi, everybody. Great, great. Good, good, good. Unfortunately, Yasha cannot be with us this weekend. Uh, Uh, Hopefully, hopefully he'll be back next weekend. Too much partying. Too much partying. You know him. Mm-hmm. He's just crazy, crazy man. <laughs> uh, but let's just jump right into the news. And with that, I turn things over to you, Bobby. Thank you very, very much, David. So let's get into it. Uh, number five this week, The Witcher is coming to Netflix. The critically acclaimed video game series that has spawned two sequels is headed to Netflix. And its creator, Andrzej Sp- Spakowski, has created this series based off of his fantasy novels that were really highly acclaimed as well and became video games. And in a press release, he said, I'm thrilled that Netflix will be doing an adaptation of my stories, staying true to the source material and the themes that I've spent over 30 years writing. David, have you ever played any of the Witcher games and would you be interested in seeing this as a series? I have not played the games. I am aware of them. I'm aware of the, uh, uh, a claim they have around them. Um, so I, I know they're good, apparently. Uh, and it's for that reason that I'm interested in this. Uh, that that's would be my only reason since I know nothing about it. <laughs> I've never played the game, so I'm not really aware of actually what it's even about. I just know that they're well-regarded games. So when you tell me, hey, a Netflix show is going to be ba- made based on this, I'm like, okay, well, people seem to be big fans of this, so maybe that'll be cool. But that's all I'm going off of, you know? Yeah, I, I got the same sort of feeling too. It's one of those games that I have high on the list of ones that I'll eventually try and play if I get around to playing video games again. Yeah. Um, it's that and Mass Effect are two of the ones I always hear a lot about. So I'm like, okay, I'll have to I have to check out these games. And this the, the I guess what the idea of what The Witcher is is kind of intriguing because they're these people that are gone through a lot of training to become um, physically and uh, I guess wrapped in magic to be able to take on these monsters and and be able to slay them for hire. So it has an interesting premise to it and knowing that it'll go to Netflix and the creator seems to be pretty thrilled and they do seem to have a, a, a good, I guess, business acumen over there at Netflix where they will let the creators or the directors really and do their own vision of what they have without minimal or any interference at all. So if this is the creator's work and he's looking forward to adapting it for Netflix, then I'm sure that we'll get something pretty, pretty well done out of it. So it has me looking forward to it in that sense. And maybe will even motivate me to uh, actually getting around to playing the, the actual game. Yeah. Michelle, did you have any I, I don't really thoughts have any that? no I don't really have any thoughts on this because like, I've heard of this but I've not read the short stories I've never played the game I have zero knowledge on this but I will mm-hmm. say just you know the fact that Netflix is willing to pick this kind of an idea up um, that's 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 it's, it, I mean, that's high regard in my opinion. Like, obviously, this is going to be... I'm sure the fans are probably losing their minds on this. I'm sure they're probably... And I have a feeling it'll be a great production value. So, yeah, no. I think it's it's cool for them. Like, it, it means nothing to me, and I'm not saying anything against it. I just I don't have any impact in my life. So, yeah. I know you sometimes have, like, uh, a lot of different novels that you've read so i wasn't i wasn't for sure if you hadn't at least heard of it in the novel world or it maybe been familiar with the actual story of it but i i get that so it's it might be something that maybe you'll see a little preview for and you'll be like hey now look look at this maybe yeah and maybe i'll see something i'll and I'll, actually I'll... check this out since it's on netflix and yeah no maybe i'll see something i'll be like yeah maybe i will pick up the short stories you know so, we'll see Who knows? yeah there you go All right, let's go into number four. And it's, uh, again, another story about Netflix. And they have announced that they will be doing a Dark Crystal prequel series called The Dark Crystal Age of Resistance. It's a 10-episode series, which will take place many years before the events of the original film. 
and will combine puppetry with a mix of digital imagery and visual effects. So, Michelle, were you ever a fan of Dark Crystal? It's funny. Actually, Dave and I had a little conversation about this the other day when it came out. Um, So, uh, I liked Dark Crystal when I was younger, but I never fell into that huge fan base that just really loves Dark Crystal. Like, I watch it, and I think it's great for the the artistry and the puppetry and I, I i see what jim henson did with his creature shop and i just, it's it's amazing like it's it's a really it's an amazing world that he created but i mean for me as far as feeling a major connection to the story itself i never really got into it in that level like i can appreciate the film but i don't have a love for it and so hearing this news is kind of like Wow, that's that's really cool. I hope they do this some justice to what you know, to that realm that Jim Henson created with this thing. But I'm kind of like, oh, cool, David, great. Uh, yeah, I am. I'm very happy about this. I'll say right off the bat. I mean, I'm a big fan of Chris Star Crystal. Uh, and yeah, when Michelle and you and when you and I talked about this, I I will admit I'm not like a diehard fan. I mean, I think Dark Crystal. I don't remember what year it came out, but I think it was, I think I was young enough that I was a little too young to be like way into it, you know, like I Mm -hmm. think I remember seeing it in the theater and in fact, probably seeing it, seeing it in the theater and being actually kind of frightened by it because I was probably so young and, you know, it's pretty dark. It's, it's pretty dark. And so I think for that reason, I, it, it didn't come out at that right time for me, for me to be like a big diehard fan of it. Maybe if it came out when I was like 10, you know, I would have like loved this, but, um, I do really dig dark crystal. I've seen it since a few times. I, I, I think it's great. You can tell it's a passion project for Jim Henson and, yeah. um, I, I love it. And I think it's, this is awesome that they're, they're doing this for Netflix. I, I cannot wait to see what they do and how it looks and I'm, I'm pumped about it. But I'm not, you know, a diehard fan of Dark Crystal. It uh, it came out in '82. Yeah, so yeah, it was that like, was the year I was born. I was like four years old. So, <laughs> like, Michelle. yeah, yeah, yeah. I Dark Crystal is as old as I am. <laughs> Let's just put that in perspective, kids. Right. Dark Crystal well, is as old as I am. <laughs> well, I, I guess it makes sense why you wouldn't have sort of been more or less attracted to it, it being the fact that it was around at the same time that you were born. But I think I was a, a, a young kid at the time. And so when I saw it, it was like you said, David, I saw it in the theater too. And the feeling I came away from after seeing it was like, it was different than anything that I had seen before. And in and, and the, in that world of using puppets and anything from Jim Henson, because at that point, all I knew of Jim Henson's stuff was his Muppets. And so this was completely different. And it was, as we mentioned before, it had a darker tone to it. So it mm. was just something that was like out of a different type of context in this fantasy sort of world. And I ate it up as a kid. And again, I wouldn't specifically say I'm a diehard fan, but I am definitely a, a big fan of it. And I, I will definitely check it out when it gets netflix it's gonna be a big thing i i I, for sure like it's gonna be huge yeah yeah number three this week uh after a long and very arduous journey the trailer for star trek discovery has finally premiered Uh, the 15 episode first season will explore the trek universe 10 years prior to the events of the original star trek series It stars Sonequa Martin-Green, Michelle Yeoh, and Jason Isaacs, and will hit CBS this fall before moving over to their streaming platform, CBS All Access. David, uh, what did you think of the trailer, and do you think it was worth the wait? All right, how much time we got? (laughs) Mm. (laughs) Um, uh, So, I watched the trailer. Uh, My reaction to the trailer itself was like, okay, I was really curious about the look of the show, uh, you know, especially thinking about budget and everything. I, I don't know. I so when I watched it, I was like, all right. Generally speaking, I I like the look. You know, it definitely doesn't look terrible. <laughs> um, and uh, but the trailer itself, I thought, was not well produced. Uh, I just it was not a well put together trailer. I've watched it about three times now, and I've just kind of like it's, it could have been just structured so much better. It, it's not a great trailer. 
and and there's even I mean like uh, Michelle Yeoh I, I love Michelle Yeoh I think she's great but the, like some of the lines we hear her deliver in this trailer and I'm I have to say, part of me is like, I don't know what to think about her in this. <laughs> you know, I mean, I hate to say that, but uh, yeah, I don't know. So yeah, so there's that. <laughs> but then I found myself like, I remember at one point I see another like screenshot of like one well, part of the trailer, and I'm looking at all like the console stuff in the in the ship, and I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. This looks kind of a little too like high tech for when it's mm. supposed to take place, right? But I, I have to say I was totally on the mindset and I, I will I know we won't go too in depth with this we won't get in full Star Trek geekdom here but I thought this was going to be on the new Kelvin timeline right and it would make sense it's 10 years right before Kirk and Spock and the Enterprise like it could be still mm-hmm. on the Kelvin timeline fine yeah and if you were to do that this would be okay fine I can totally buy into that but now I'm realizing that this is apparently on the prime timeline, what uh, what we as Trek fans refer to as the original timeline. So basically 10 years before the Kirk and Spock on the Enterprise we know from the original series. like, And now I'm left going, wait the fuck, no. <laughs> like, what, what the hell is going on with this look? That makes no fucking sense. Like, why would you do that? Like, why not just say it's on the Kelvin timeline? Now, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe Bobby, you know more than me, like from the little bit I've looked at online, everyone, I think when they're claiming that this is on the prime timeline is referring to what Brian Fuller had said back in like August, which when he blatantly said, hey, this is going to take place on the prime timeline. But I, part of me wonders like, if, you know, he's not involved with the show anymore. Like maybe it was a change of, did a change of mind happen at some point? And we don't know that. Like did this, did CBS and the production company actually decide to put it on the Kelvin timeline and they just hasn't, haven't told everybody yet. Like, cause again, that would make so much more sense. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, to have it on the prime timeline makes zero sense. And I mean, if you want to get into details about Star Trek, I mean, Kirk wasn't the first captain of that enterprise. We had Pike before that. And I believe another captain even before Pike. And when you look at the timeline, if this is 10 years before Kirk and Spock on that enterprise, that enterprise that we know from the original series is out in, in the universe at the same time as Star Trek discovery is happening. That, that makes no sense. (laughs) You know, none like, it's super frustrating and you have to know as a studio like when you're doing star trek these are the kind of fans we are like i mean i'm not saying things need to be perfect in continuity i'm obviously the original series was made a long time ago and i'm not saying you're gonna match that look but you know come on right like the enterprise is the crown jewel of the entire federation fleet like so Looking at this spaceship versus no, no, <laughs> you cannot do. You cannot make this one overly bad at. No, it has to be pretty much on par if you're going to keep this in the prime. I just, yeah, no. Like it's funny because when I first saw the trailer, I kind of had the same thoughts. I was like, well, I like the the look. Like I'm I'm digging it. I'm like, and in my head, I'm watching it, thinking this is Kelvin timeline. And I'm like, I like the look, although this trailer is kind of a hot mess. The shit's just everywhere, and it's just I don't like it. They slap dash that bad boy together pretty fast, I think. Yeah. But and I'm like, okay, okay, cool. And then. Like the next day, the whole like, conversation that we all kind of had about this whole thing going down about it not being uh, in the Kelvin timeline and it being the prime, I was like, "Wait, what?" <laughs> like, I went, my head went. I, I had to do a double take. I'm like, "No, no, no. That makes no sense. That makes no sense. What I'm seeing visually, and what I'm understanding, like, n- no, no. I and it just and." I feel like the smart way would have been to put it in the Kelvin timeline. Like that's what, that's what people are familiar with right now. And that's, and that's the what, beauty, the beauty of what they decided to do when they made the 2009 Star Trek with JJ Abrams and to create this new timeline. The beauty of that decision is that it allows you to make movies in this time frame and still kind of basically do whatever you want. Like that, that's right. what's so genius about that decision creatively. Yes. Like you don't fuck with old Star Trek and yes. it, it remains the same. You don't have to worry about that continuity anymore. You can do your own thing now. 
That's why you did it, you know? And, and that's why the show should have done that. Take advantage of that and put that there. Let's just not mess with old Star Trek. Let's just leave it alone. <laughs> and it's fine. We love it. And I mean, if you are going to make something around that universe, you're going to be careful about it. You're obviously not being careful with this. Clear, yeah. Clearly. Like, right. it's... Uh, yeah, we, I could talk about this one for a while. Right. But yeah, no, it's just... It, it's not... I, I I wonder who their advisors were who were sitting in that room and they're like going wait like I feel like they could have easily taken a poll of just a couple of like tracky people and people would have been in the room pretty quick and been like wait 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 hands up no I don't question yeah <laughs> no no that doesn't work no we won't buy that that's not gonna happen like it could have I don't know yeah and depending on what is being said in the first few episodes that they've made I mean as long as you haven't touched on anything that would you know fuck with this I mean you basically could still go actually we changed your mind this is this is common timeline <laughs> you know yeah. it's it you know, uh, if we did uh, say something that wouldn't work with that, we'll just quickly go back and do a reshoot real fast and edit it or something. I don't know, but y- you could still change your mind here. That's why I feel like maybe it has been changed and we don't know it yet, or pe- you know, the studio hasn't said so. I don't know. I'm I'm really I'm really hoping that they have some kind of weird epiphany all of a sudden, and they're like, wait, no, you know what? No, 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 because it just yeah. No. I will say though, I am excited. Seeing and I'm gonna try to say her name right. Uh, Sonika Martin Green. She was in Walking Dead. She played uh, Sonia, and I love her. Like I think she's a fabulous actress, and I'm really excited to see her in such a major role for this film I, right. or this show. Excuse me. Like I think, yeah, no, I, I'm I'm geeking up pretty hard, and I like Michelle Yeoh a lot too. But I was like, oh, like when I heard that she was going to this, I was like, oh, oh, yay, because I I really enjoy her and I really want to see her career go further. Like. I'm very happy with her. Totally saw it. Anyways. Yeah, I guess for my part, I'll say this. I think for a show that will essentially live on a streaming service, it visually and the visual effects are phenomenal. They, it looks very well yeah. Yeah. put together, pretty. But uh, story wise and, and how this all fits into everything is leaving me scratching my head. It, and it's, it's, it bothers me because mm-hmm. it's continuity type things. And it seems like star Trek as a, as a franchise seems so afraid to move past next generation. Like mm-hmm. they don't want to go 50 years or a hundred years past that and, and have us have a new star Trek that takes place in that universe. I don't know what, why it I may know, be a spirit I don't that I, I, they yeah. don't, they don't maybe feel like they, they can have a, the ability to show uh, technology that would be a hundred years past what we saw in Next Generation and make it seem, you know, something like, oh, that's new and different and, and inventive. Maybe they don't have ideas for that. I don't know what it is, but for whatever reason, they don't seem to want to go past it. And if you're not going to go past it and you're going to give us something like this, you, you have to be very careful of wh- how you're trying to create this new thing because I think I had asked David and I don't know I don't remember you giving me an answer but as far as what Star Trek does in the terms of the two different ideas of uh, time travel is it going along the lines of you when you go back in time and you do something does it create multiple timelines or is it the one where it overwrites the timeline and it's still just one continuous timeline I feel like your question is more of a, <laughs> I don't know how to answer this, but I, I don't, I don't think it in a way I'm going to say, I don't think it matters. Like, I mean, I think as fans of Star Trek, we just recognize that there are basically two timelines. Like we have the original and now we've got this other one. I mean, in a way, I feel like your question is more of a scientific question <laughs> than, well, than the reason why I ask is because I figure if they do it as two separate timelines, and if they're saying that this is still takes place on the prime timeline, then it, it leaves them maybe the opening to just say, well, uh, those events that happen to create the Kelvin timeline don't occur in this one that continues on the same pathway yeah, that abs- we get for the original series. Absolutely. I mean, if indeed this is on the prime timeline, then that did not happen and for these people. Like right. uh, the that ship coming back, the Narada coming mm-hmm. back and encountering the Kelvin and that whole thing on this timeline, like even you know, in the, that, that never happen. happened for them in the past. Right. Would I mean that's the only way so, I can see it. 
but the the thing is that still is weird weird weirding me out is um <laughs> I think I know where you're going did, with this, but <laughs> why the hell do the Klingons how do they change in ten years from whatever it is that they look like in this series to how they look in the original series? I yeah, it's it's just another evidence of why this makes no sense. <laughs> just, yeah, I mean, and, and and this is from a teaser trailer, and we we have already these many questions. Like this is, yeah. Again, just CBS, just just put it on Kelvin, and we're cool. Everything's fine. It, yeah. If they literally really, just put it on Kelvin, I'm I would happy. have no more questions. I'd be like, Meh, anything you do at this point, I cannot question. Like, yeah, it's I fine. Really I'll just I'll enjoy this. It's cool. It's great. I, and then I can just judge on is it a good Star Trek show or not, which I don't know yet. Right, but exactly. Right now, again, it, yeah, questions abound. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, anyways. Well, we could spend all day. Oh, yeah, we could talk all while. We, we could have do, we could done a whole two. episode just on this, quite honestly. Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, let's and, go to the number two this week. And looks as though we're down to two directors in the running for Warner Brothers' big screen film for The Flash. Reports earlier in the week had directors Sam Raimi, Mark Webb, Robert Zemeckis, and Matthew Vaughn all vying for the job. But after both Raimi and Webb passed on the project, now it's down to just Zemeckis and Vaughn, with sources saying that Zemeckis is the front runner. So for me, mm-hmm. I think who I would like to actually see in this role of um, director for the two that we have left, I probably want to see Robert Zemeckis direct it, but not just because he's done like Back to the Future and he kind of has that sensibilities of something to be able to do for this, but I, I think it's more or less because I, I want Matthew Vaughn either still doing Kingsman movies, if the second one turns out to be pretty good, or him doing something else. I think because of what he's done with uh, X-Men First Class and what he did also here with uh, the Kingsmen and everything I've seen from him has just always been really good, kick-ass. It's just like, I would want to see him, if he's doing another comic book property, I think the one that I've always said he would be really good for and could do wonders with would be Fantastic Four because he gets team dynamics, he gets humor he gets everything that could be what fantastic four should be and i think he could help fox desperately in that situation since he's been within their camp before and working with the x-men but that aside i think that um uh i I would just want to see him doing something else i don't think that he would have a hard time or difficult time doing the flash in fact i think he probably would technically be better than um robert zemeckis for it but I want to see him doing other things, so that's kind of why I say Zemeckis. But if you had to go with one of the two, who would you go with, Michelle? You know, I actually fully agree with you on this one, Bobby. I think I think Zemeckis has kind of a look about a lot of the films that he does and kind of a feel to it that I think fits really well with the Flash's like, overall... like theming and feeling and emotions that they kind of have with that storyline like it just I think it's going to portray the certain look that the, the, the comics at least have always kind of had and I think yeah no I, f- I like I like that idea a lot and I agree with you like I think having Vaughn do something else like, and yeah Fantastic Four I think he would re- I think he would nail that like that would be amazing and yeah I can't argue with it at all I totally agree with you 100% and I think that's exactly how I feel about it Dude? Uh, yeah, no, I totally disagree. Uh, really? No. I mean, if you were just talking about what do I think is best for The Flash, I think Vaughn is a way better fit. I think uh, his sense of humor would be a much better fit for that kind of movie. Uh, Zemeckis is one of those directors that in his uh, older years, I I would question any choices he might want to make on this kind of film. And he's definitely a great director, and he had some really great films in his past. It's I hate it's kind of like the Ridley Scott situation and you know certain movies he's made recently um, you know like mm. I, I don't know I would be much more skeptical and not so sure about a Zemeckis Vaughn I feel like oh man he's gonna nail this like you know at Zemeckis I would be left going he could but I don't know like and sure I get what you guys are saying in terms of Vaughn directing other stuff absolutely but if we're just talking about who would be a better fit for the Flash I hands down I picked on. They wouldn't even think about it. 
I agree. I, I think he's a better fit, but yeah, I just don't want to see him on there just because of the reasons I said, but also because for me, I, I don't think I can name a bad movie Matthew Vaughn's done. I, I like Stardust as well, so I, it's just like everything that he's done, I've liked, and I'd hate to see him get entangled with Warner Brothers and them taint his uh, movie <laughs> going batting right. average for me. I don't want to see him get mixed in with that machine over there just yet. Uh, let them figure some things out first and then sort of uh, throw them in on a project where they seem to be a well-oiled machine by that point in time. Then I'd be like, all right, all right cool. But yeah, there's still so much uh, uncertainty over there that I just don't want to see him get caught up in it. So I'm like, just throw a, a bet in like Robert Zemeckis who maybe has more pull and you, you're not really going to be apt to sort of bossing someone like him around. So maybe he can sort of make more um, of a cohesive movie than um, maybe Matthew Vaughn would be allowed to make. But that's kind of my sort of look at it. I still feel like Zemeckis would actually bring a different tone to the DC world doing The Flash. Like, it, it, everybody keeps talking about, like, kind of softening it up and lightening it up. And I think Zemeckis would do that with The Flash. And, like, I'm just saying, visual, I? I, I just, uh, I just, I feel like that would bring what everybody's asking DC to do. Like, that's what they want. Like, mm. he would bring that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think Vaughn would just do it even better. Uh, that's all I'm saying. I mean, hey, if if we hadn't had this conversation about like Vaughn and I, you know, an announcement had been made a week ago, hey, Zemeckis is the director, I'd be like, awesome. This, you know, sure. Right. I have some, you know, questions, you know, but I, I, I still might be a little fearful he might not do a great job, but I'd be cool with that. Mm-hmm. But if you're asking me to pick him or Vaughn, I'm like, oh, well, I'm, I mean, Vaughn, <laughs> like, you, like you just said, Bobby, like he's pretty much batting uh, a thousand. Like he's, yeah. he's really done nothing wrong at this point. Uh, I feel like, his, again, his sense of humor would be a really great fit. I just, I, I'd have to pick Vaughn. Yeah. I mean, I get it. Zubekis really hasn't directed, per se, anything really recently that's been pretty spectacularly big. <laughs> Yeah, you had that kind pro- of run of computer animated stuff that I'm like, Ugh. But he has produced a ridiculous amount of things, and I think he wants to try to get his hand back in the game, and I think it could be good. It absolutely could be. Uh, again, I'm not not uh, hating huh? on Zemeckis. Just... Right, I don't know. I'm with you. Cool. Well, let's go on to our number one story I think of the I week. Know, I think I know what this one is, too, by the way. I think oh, I know, okay. I think I know, I think let's play this. I think I know. I think I know. I think I know. Okay, Michelle, what, what do you think the number one story of the week is? And you're probably right, but let's see what you think it is. I'm 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 assuming it might have a little something to do with a character named Venom. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. <laughs> uh, so I said, you know, Sony has played this very well because yeah. <laughs> in an attempt to show to show just how serious they are about a Spider-Man universe without Spider-Man, the studio has officially signed Tom Hardy to play the role of Eddie Brock, a.k.a. Venom, in their big screen release. The movie is set for release on October 5th, 2018. And since you just called it out, Michelle, what do you think about Tom Hardy going from playing Bane in the Batman series to Venom in a standalone movie? Yeah, I'm good with it. So good with it. Like, <laughs> I wish I could be like, oh, but he's so... No, super, super okay with it. I think it's a great fit. Like... Yeah, no, hell yes. <laughs> I'm, mm. I'm good, good, good job, guys. You are officially going in the correct directions now. I like this. I'm quickly getting on board. Yeah, that's all I got. <laughs> and David, uh, no, I mean Tom. I love Tom Hardy. <laughs> I mean, I for that reason alone, and you do you tell me you're gonna cast Tom Hardy in a major character like this that I know is beloved by a lot of people then sure, that's awesome. I mean, I, I'm not going to lie. It's not like when I read it, I had, a, I think, a reaction like most just because this, again, this universe I'm not as familiar with, Venom, I, I don't really have a background with. So I, in general, a Venom movie does not have any interest for me right now. Um, but I ha- you know, seeing how excited everyone else is, then it makes me want to be like, well, I'm definitely interested in what they end up doing with this. But right now, I'm like, I'm like okay, cool. Like, cause I'm, this, that's great. I, I have no context of what this character should be like, and if I think Tom Hardy is the right kind of actor for this, I have no clue. So, uh, just knowing that I like Tom Hardy would be the only reason. I'm like, great, two thumbs up. I'm all for it. You know, yeah, it's it's one of the things. Like when they first announced this, I was like, oh, a Venom film. Like, and I really kind of was thinking, it's just it's not necessary. It's not required. I don't 
think there I, I know there's a, a fan base for Venom but it's not like it's a huge 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 fan base and I was like I don't think the demand's that high and I'd said like for me to be on board with this like to really be like okay you're gonna have to sign on some pretty spectacular actors producers writers and directors and so for this to come out I was like oh okay like it's like I feel like there's there's there are steps towards something here and I'm like okay now you are building momentum I am starting to get on board this train so yeah yeah, to me, I, I liken this as to Sony coming into a room, announcing this, and then dropping the mic because <laughs> it's it's so mm-hmm. huge. In any scenario that I ever imagined, never did I think Tom Hardy or someone of that caliber of an actor would be signed on to do their Venom movie because this was obviously their attempt to still sort of squeeze money out of the Spider-Man franchise while they have it as their still a licensed property. So obviously the fact that they're sharing the character with the Marvel's studios and they have that whole thing going, they were, I just figured, you know, they were going to abandon their ideas that they had for their spinoffs for Venom and all these other things, but they were persistent in going ahead with it, which uh, to most people's, thoughts was just not really a good idea because it would cause confusion and just it just didn't seem like they would really put a lot of effort into it other than the fact that they just wanted to go for the cash and and try and get it just based off of the heat that spider-man would be getting especially being part of the mcu now but this is a big thing and how it will play out in terms of the the way it fits or in this sense doesn't fit into the mcu of things it's it's going to be very interesting because if you're going to go with a character like Venom and you're going to have Tom Hardy, and part of me wants to say that would have been perfect if it was still part of the MCU in the movies. But then there is a side of me that says that if that had have been the case, how much would he have gotten a chance to um, showcase Venom in a Spider-Man movie that's in part of the mcu you know we've seen that the for for better or for worse that the villains in marvel films get the short end of the stick compared to the heroes which Mm -hmm. i am personally okay with because it gives the hero a chance to shine and the emphasis is on the hero but with a character like venom who is a a bit more layered in the same way that the joker is uh, you don't want him to see that character get sh- shortchanged and like he sort of I essentially did get in Raimi's Spider-Man mm-hmm. 3. So having him have his own standalone is a good idea, although I just wish it was still part of the MCU in a way that could have been more organic because now they there, it sets up a lot of questions and we'll have to see where it goes. But just having Tom Hardy's name attached to it lends so much more... Um, emphasis to what Sony is trying to do with this uh, spin-off version of the series than what we would have originally thought if they had just put some other actor in there that was not as big of a name or, or as uh, well-renowned of an actor as someone like Tom Hardy. So, interesting times. I mean, it comes yeah. out in October of next year, so we'll, we'll definitely be seeing and hearing a lot about this within the next few months because of the fact that it's going to be coming up pretty soon with production starting this year. So we'll see how that all pans out. Yeah. It, it makes me feel like this isn't such a cash grab as they were like, they're really putting thought into it. Like to get Tom Hardy to sign on to something like this, it's Mm -hmm. there's yeah. It makes it feel not so like, Oh, we're just going to try to make as much as we can while we still have the rights. Like it's just, Yeah, no, it feels like they're actually putting, they want to put effort into the story. And I agree, it would be, it would be great to really see it done in more of the MCU. But I mean, I don't know, I'm curious. And and this is, this gives me a step of hopefulness that I, I really didn't care about when I first heard about this news completely. And so now I'm like, oh, hey, now I'm okay. Okay, now let's see what else happens. So, Mm -hmm. and I'm in the kind of the same boat too, even though, like I'm saying, I'm, I don't have any familiarity with Venom, but knowing that, okay, you're casting this caliber of actor in the role, then all right, cool. Like, you're taking it seriously. You're taking it seriously. I can, hopefully this is good. Yeah. I can dig it. Yeah. 
I, I'm hoping it, it, in their universe, it's a world without a Spider-Man. Like he was there, but he got killed or something. I don't know. Right. But yeah. Well, that yeah. It, it's a way that you can explain it in a way that makes sense and and gives you a good jumping off point to be able to accept this universe that they're trying to create without Spider-Man in it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and before I turn it back to you with the rest of uh, the end of the show, um, this just in uh, from Variety. They're reporting that the Resident Evil franchise is set for a reboot. And that's all the details we have at this what? point. What? Resident Evil reboot? Hey. <laughs> I have never seen a Resident Evil movie. I have I zero desire to see any of them. I'm so mad. <laughs> So I mean, yeah, they're they're bad that they're good for the I most know. part, but some of them are just kind of bad. But some of them are <laughs> bad, kind of so good. Bad. But uh, all I'll say is that if they are rebooting it, I'm hoping that it gives them a chance to maybe do it more in line with the actual video game series, and right? Right. Give it the, um, the horror uh, that would be zombie. kind of refreshing. I mean, how do you not? Movie, if you're going to so go out of your way to had, reboot it, you know? had, Oh my god, that's so great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, that's it for the news this week, David. Oh, thank you, Bobby. Uh, and with that, we will be checking out. Um, as always, we'd love to hear back from everybody. Um, you can email us at feedback at flickereffect.com. Go to our website, flickereffect.com. Look on the right hand side. We have links to Facebook, uh, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, all that good stuff. Uh, check those out over there. And with that, I'm David Lott. I'm Bobby Jackson. I'm Michelle Curry. Thanks for listening.